I'd like to welcome you guys to another uh, Visual Insights here. For the ones who know me, um, Ryan Harrison. Uh, for the ones who don't know me, uh, I've been training visual performance skills for the last 20 years. Uh, I started working with athletes from professional baseball to collegiate baseball, ball, golfers, all, uh, car drivers, all different sports on the visual impact of how their sport uh integrates vision on there. And I learned from uh, my father, Dr. Bill Harrison, who started in the 1970s, uh, working with the Kansas City Royals, and over 50 years, uh, I have learned uh, many things from him and to be able to apply. And about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I got the opportunity to, uh, to meet Todd Hodnett uh, from Accuracy First and had a very uh, fascinating and interesting conversation with him. And, you know, this is the great thing for me that I've gotten to do is as I've traveled the world and, and spoken with different athletes, I've been around some of the top people in their industry, and it's always fun to be interactive and talk shop and see how vision plays a role in here. So I'm lucky to have Todd on today. Todd, uh, why don't you give a little bit of background of uh, where you come from, how you got into becoming a long-range shooting instructor, and, and, um, and a little background there, and we'll go, get going from there. All right. Hey, guys. Uh, basically, with that – Going too long on this, uh, my name is Todd Hodden. I own Accuracy First. We do sniper training or long range training for the military predominantly. Uh, we're booked over a year out and have been that way for probably, we've been doing this for 17 years, probably been booked out for over a year for about 14 years. So this is something we do every day. Uh, long range, uh, it used to be something that was considered, you know, more aloof. It was harder to understand. You needed to be a, a Marine Corps sniper instructor to actually really be good at it. And the reality is we've taken a lot of this and, and made it easy for everybody. So uh, we focused on, you know, really trying to make the, the sport of long range shooting uh, easy and fast, uh, predominantly for the military. You know, the, you know when they're in a uh, combat situation, it, they don't need to pull out a calculator to make a wind call. They need to do stuff quickly. So these are the things that we worked on, whether it was ballistic engines or it was uh, uh, reticle designs. Uh, this is what we kind of brought new stuff in, into our field, uh, being the long range field right now. And so that's what we focus on now. You know, my, my background was rancher farmer uh, growing up. I was lucky enough to grow up on Prairie Dog Town, so I had a lot of shooting. Uh, that started about six years old and moved on through there. Ranching farm for a good period of time, then I got into uh, pistol shooting or uh, cowboy action shooting. Uh, went out and shot, uh, won nationals uh, the first year. Uh, it wasn't that easy. This was three hours of dry fire every night. And, you know, so a lot of the visualization that we're talking about in the show was stuff I learned during this uh, process of my life. So, you know, was heavy into uh, golfing prior to that. And at one time was hoping to go pro, but ended up uh, losing a, a corn crop to eight and a half inch range, which kind of shifted directions in my life. So the, the golfing side was the same, you know, heavy into the visualization. Uh, and, and the mental focus part. Uh, playing pool or billiards, you know, when I was younger, uh, the same thing, you know, seeing everything before it happens. So this was stuff that, you know, I've been working on and doing for uh, a lot of my life uh, without any real thought to it until the Cowboy Action side. And then I started teaching my own classes uh, after I won nationals. And then I did uh, Vegas seminars uh, where it was, you know, the human performance, uh, the, the mental aspect of human performance. Uh, where you actually think all the way through uh, each stage. And, and you bring that kind of with you uh, throughout all aspects of your life. So it, it's something that, you know, you, you try to work in a calm manner, uh, even though you may be doing something that requires speed. Uh, you, try to, you try to do it through the fact that you earn those skill sets and you're trying to allow yourself to perform at the speed that you can do it. So this was stuff that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm actually heavy into and think a lot about, I uh, really believe in, and, you know, not probably as much in this part of my world with the long range shooting. Uh, it's not something that we, you know, visualize a two mile shot. Uh, we may try to visualize where the bullet is in flight uh, all the way through that. So, uh, but more for trying to figure out a wind call and how wind's going to affect it. But again, fundamentals are fundamentals. And when you lay down to take that shot, you know, you need to apply all your skill sets, all the fundamentals, every shot. And this is something that in the visualization, the mental aspect of it, this is something we still do, you know, on every shot. 
And Todd, you said so much there, you get me excited. Um, you know, just, I mean, you know, obviously a fascinating life that you have here. There is going from a farmer, uh, shooting at six years old, where I, you know, I come from a beach town where we don't shoot guns, unfortunately. So I, I, I question you whether you can sh even teach me how to shoot, but I'm sure we'll <laughs> figure out something on there. But, you know, with um, going from shooting guns at six and, and pistols and then turning yourself into a long range shooting instructor and instructing civilians, uh, snipers, uh, military all over the world is, is really fascinating. But, you know, we, we have these great conversations and, you know, there, there's too many stories and I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but for you as a, as a pistol shooter and becoming a very competitive, and I know in the golfing situation as well, which is fascinating, what, um, you know, how did you become a pistol shooter? Is it just repetition, just going out and shoot, 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 and, and all of a sudden become the next guy? Or, or how, how would I you know, what are some of the things I could do to help myself become a pistol shooter? You, you know, probably with pistol more than anything else, uh, the, the mental side is huge. So when I started shooting pistol, I'd shot pistols in the past, uh, but I had not trained with a pistol. I had not shot competition. So most of my stuff was 22 rifles uh, all the way through 22, 250, 30, 30, just rifle shooting, you know, growing up. And then, Later on, I had a buddy call me up and said, hey, I think I found our sport. Uh, it's cowboy action shooting, blah, 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 blah. At this time, I was still trying to get back into the golfing game a little bit. So I was like, man, you know, I'm doing a little golf instruction, you know, helping some kids out, and I really don't have time. Love shooting. So I was very interested uh, in shooting, but not really in cowboy action shooting at the time. I was already a cowboy. I didn't want to dress up on the weekend and – <laughs> try to dress up to what I did every day. And I certainly wanted to carry a horse around all over the country. Uh, so this was something that, you know, I really wanted to kind of step away from what I did every day. I didn't understand the sport. So it was the fastest growing shooting sport at the time. When I won nationals, it was about 900 people there at nationals. Uh, it's a really fast, quick sport. You shoot four guns every time you step up, two pistols, rifle, shotgun. Uh, it's all about transitions, economy, and motion. So, uh, it, when it comes to a pistol, I think the number one thing with the pistol was dry fire. So I, I bought all my guns after, long story, went out deer hunting with my buddy and I, I, just being nice, I said, hey, you know, let's go shoot your cowboy guns. Uh, it was midday, the deer weren't up and moving. So we went back and, and played with his guns a little bit. Well, it was only about a week before I had all my guns. So I'm, I'm a, uh, addicted to competition. Uh, and when we went out and we played with it for a little bit, I was like, man, I could really get into this. So I bought all the guns, but I didn't have my reloader. I didn't have any of the setup that I needed. So I was like, hey, I'm going to dry fire. So I would dry fire for about three hours a night. And so I made it a habit that year of dry firing three hours a night every night. So if I got in at midnight, I dry fire until three o'clock in the morning. So this is something that, you know, you, you have to earn those skill sets. You know, when I won nationals, there was a lot of people said, oh, you know, he's a natural. And nobody's really a natural at that stuff. So, you know, you earn and pay your dues. Uh, some people, you know, don't have to pay maybe as many dues, but I guarantee you those guys that are winning national and world events and regionals, uh, in any sport, they're paying their dues. They're putting time in on the range. And, and that three hours a night of dry fire was, if I contribute anything towards the start of my shooting career, that was it. It, it was, you know, not the – thousand rounds a day that I shot wildfire. Uh, you know, it, I think it was that year I shot about 70,000 rounds a year pistol. And, you know, most of the time I'd at least shoot 500 rounds a day. Uh, obviously there's days that you don't do anything. And then a couple of days, maybe a week before the match, uh, a major match, I'd shoot 2,000 rounds a day. So this is something that, you know, you, you focus on and you work hard at. But even with the live fire, I always tell somebody, I took two students that had never shot before and I give one a thousand rounds a day and teach him and I've got another person they dry fire for three hours a day, I would nearly guarantee you the person that never fired a live round would actually be able to beat the guy that shot a thousand rounds a day because under recoil, he's not going to be able to see uh, a lot of the errors, a lot of his mistakes. Uh, that as the gun reports and goes off, he, he's going to have recoil. He's going to be thinking about other things other than what happened when that site, where that site was, where did it move to, uh, when the gun went click. So this is, you know, the, the dry fire is probably the biggest aspect. 
the, the mental side of that, actually, you know, uh, what you let really me, let work me ask on. You, I'm going to stop you for a second. Let me ask you a question on the dry fire. It, is the dry fire, uh, when you do that, is that a very uh, internal or external? And what I mean, that are you, are you visualizing? Are you picturing? Are you, are you focused on a target? Or are you thinking about your elbows and your, and your stance and stuff like that? You know, it, it's, it's a little bit of both because you, you have to work fundamentals, so you can't get sloppy. Uh, and once you get sloppy, everything kind of goes awry in your training. So, but what training is, you're wanting to push. And this is where you build your speed. So, you know, initially when I would start my, every drop our practice, we'd be started at about 25% speed. So it would be just slow motion coming up, making sure all the fundamentals came together, where you met your hand, how you pick the uh, gun up out of the holster, uh, uh, picking up the sights as soon as possible, slow push out, acquiring the target uh, with sights aligned, breaking the shot as soon as everything was aligned, continuing out. And, and so you're, you're focusing on the fundamentals at first, and then you build speed into your practice. Uh, but the mental side, uh, you start training your brain uh, on what is acceptable. So at this point, it, 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 the, the mental side comes in huge in the individual focus. I, I want to see the draw. I want to see the sides. Uh, basically, you're telling your mind what is acceptable, so it will repeat it under speed. And then so as we go through that, uh, then on target, you may be shooting one target, transitioning to another target. And you want to actually see when you're going to cock that weapon system. These were uh, single action army pistols, so you'd have to cock it each time. Uh, it may be with a shotgun, and I may be, you know, picking up two rounds out of my belt, dropping one in, sliding, pulling with this finger. And as soon as I'd slam fire, I would cock it back, pushing against my shoulder, dropping the next one in. But you would visually see each step all the way through. Uh, and make sure that you actually see when you pull the trigger that you're on target. You know, you're not off target when you're pulling the trigger. Again, what we're doing, what we're focusing on is training our brain. Train your brain to what is acceptable under speed, it'll repeat it. And so I used to tell people in my mental classes, uh, you know, ha has anybody ever got butterflies? And I tell people, you know, I did. I can remember the day or the weekend that I won nationals, uh, I walked up to the first stage it just blew up in my chest, you know, butterflies all in my stomach. I just turned around and walked away. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to go back. I am going to shoot 80% what I'm capable of every day. Not going to try to overrun because what most people try to do is they go, you know, this is nationals. I'm going to try and give it 110%. Well, 110% yeah, is off the rails. You're going to screw up because basically that's why we get the uh, uh, butterflies is you're asking your brain to do something it doesn't know how to do. That's what the butterflies are. So it's going like, yep, I'm with you on 110%. I don't know where we're going to get the extra speed, but let's do this. And so you jump out there and take off. The next thing you know, you outrun your headlights. You're running in the dark, and you're going to trip and fall over something uh, it is, as a analogy. Uh, but honestly, you, you're going to trip over your sights, and you're going to miss targets, and you're going to uh, make bad decisions. You're going to be ahead of yourself. So running at the speed normally if you back off a little bit under the adrenaline of the match we would actually run over the actual speed that we would normally run the deal even though i'm trying to run 85 percent i may catch myself being a little faster than i would have even tried to shoot it at pure speed you know so it, it, it gives you that edge but once you learn how to control it you know what? uh in, in the visualization of each step and i can't i can't stress that enough but uh, I can remember at nationals, it was the 11th stage. And I was, I mean, footfalls, we focus on everything. You know, as soon as the buzzer goes off, where's my hand going? Where's my first step going? And we actually follow each step to the draw, how we holster, we're picking up another gun. I mean, we're, we're doing everything, visualizing each shot. And I got to the last target, it was a triple tap. So it was three shots on one target. So I can remember in my mind, I, I methodically went through the whole stage, and as soon as I got to the last target in my mind, I went, yep, three shots. Turned around, walked off. Guess what happened? My body did exactly what I told it was acceptable. The second shot went off the target because I didn't see sights on every one of those three shots. I should have said bang, bang, bang in my mind. Saw the shot, or saw the sight center of the target, moved on you know, to the unloading table in my mind and walked off with a good run. But I did, and I went, and that's what I did in real time. Missed my second shot, and it nearly cost me the match. 
So, so you know, that, that's kind of an interesting, you know, <laughs> again, there's so many things here you get me excited about, but, you know, you, what you're kind of talking about there is your eyes kind of went on to the next thing. You were always in advance instead of finishing the task at hand. And, you know, it's some things, some words I'm going to bounce around here is try easier instead of try faster, like you said. And I know, especially in baseball, but this is all sports, you know, everyone right now in baseball thinks they got to swing as hard as they can and swing, you know, harder and harder. And these guys, their head is jumping out like this. Their eyes are coming off. Instead of focusing on what we talk about, focusing on the task. What is the task? How do we get there? And, you know, your task, you have to hit your target before you can go on to that next task. Would that be correct? And then on top of that, you know, another thought process I have on here is you spent a lot of time picturing, picturing why you were doing that action, why you're taking your steps, uh, why you are practicing your dry fire. But I want to know, did you picture a lot when you were laying in bed or sitting around or date, you know, some people call it daydreaming. Did you picture how that movement worked without actually walking through it? Oh yeah. I, I think a lot of times, uh, especially in the early learning days and maybe even uh, when, you, when you've reached that 99 percentile, and you're trying to get that extra 0.1, 0.2, you know, percent, uh, you, you mentally walk through problems. And that most of the time, that's how we solve the problem. So you're trying to visually see, and, and most of the time, that's what we're talking about. It, we dry fire at the house, but when we're at the stage uh, or at the match, looking at a stage, you can't pull a gun out. I mean, it's, it's a safety issue. So you, you step up there and you walk through it and everybody's walking through it with you, but mentally, you're drawing your gun out and you're focusing on your sights and you pull the trigger and you move to the next target. So uh, obviously you're not doing that with a, with a real gun out while there's a whole bunch of people around, nobody's in control. So uh, it, it's something that is mental. You're sitting there focusing through it. That's probably not the time to try to solve a problem that you had two weeks ago. Obviously you don't need, even need to be thinking about that problem two weeks ago. So, you know, if you're having a problem uh, transitioning or, uh, a problem mentally with anything, probably laying in bed, you know, late at night, I catch myself waking up at three o'clock in the morning going, ah, that, that'll do it. That'll fix it. You know, and you want to jump up and go get your guns on or, or you know, go try it right then. You know, you're excited that you may have found it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, uh, but yeah, I think a lot of times, you know, laying in bed, focusing back early on, I, you know, I was driving a tractor a lot, riding a horse a lot across a ranch a lot of alone time. So it's just 42 miles out in the country. Not uh, yeah. So, you know, it's one of those deals that, you know, you spend a lot of time uh, running through problems, solving stuff. You know, I used to do a lot of math in my head uh, when I was sitting on the tractor and a lot of people, you know, in the cycle world, all of a sudden, boom, a lot of that uh, skill set that I built doing math in my head, I've taken over into the cycle, call it easy math, third grade math, which we, we break it down to, to something that everybody can do and it's easy and it's actually quick. Uh, but now something that I started on back in you know, my early 20s, we're using now uh, in, in the soccer world. So it's kind of funny, but it's, 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 it's the same process. Yeah, and we haven't really talked much about your sniper yet, but, you know, this, I want to go back on the pistol a little bit and, and even maybe your golf skill set. Um, you found a way, whatever way, whatever reasoning you got into picturing, did you, were you real, did you picture the negative stuff or the bad habits or did you really spend a lot of time picturing the good stuff? No, usually uh, we, we try not to focus on the bad because, uh, I mean, that's, you know, like right now, uh, for example, we've got heavy into shooting shotguns over the past year and a half, so shooting sporting clays and ski, uh, playing a little trap. Uh, but you never focus on, you know, why you always miss on station two, the high house, you know, because you're, you're telling your brain that's acceptable when you focus on that. So, if you have a problem, we do have to focus on the problem and we do have to fix it. So if number two high house on a ski range is, is your nem nemesis, you need to stop and stand there for 25 rounds and knock that out. Make your, make your worst problem your best bird. Make it where you drill it every day. You know exactly where you need to hold. So, yes, there are times to focus on it. But uh, absolutely, we never focus on problems during the match or – uh, during what I call the, the physical performance aspect of, of uh, whatever you're doing, whether it's shooting long range, uh, hitting a drive, playing golf, uh, playing pool, uh, 
you know, doing a combo shot, whatever it is, uh, ski, trap. You never focus on the bad while you're actually doing it. If, if you're in a training environment and you can, uh, you, you need to stop and fix your problem. And that may, that may mean, you know, that you're not continuing on with the day like you first thought you would. Uh, you may sit there and shoot a hundred rounds from one spot just because you were having problems with that one. Don't let it build into a problem where you always hate number two high house, you know, because it's like, I, I always miss that target. And I hear guys do this all the time and it drives me up a while ago. Man, I always miss this shot. I hate it. And they get up there and sure enough, they miss it two more times. Oh, yeah. You know, so, Oh, yeah. you know, same thing with golf. There's the, I hate this hole. I, I, I can never hit on that hole. Or I hate this pitcher, whatever it is. Yep. And, you know, one of the things that you're kind of talking about, and, and these are putting a few words to it, is, is really having after action review or uh, a recall. Okay, what happened? I misstep. Well, why did I misstep? I misstep because I was internal or because there was a hole there or whatever it is. Okay, now how do I fix that problem? Now picture myself how I'm going to go through it properly and practice that properly and then be able to just throw that in the trash. So have that quick review, trash it. Yeah, usually it depends. If, if I have to repeat that, that action, all right? So if I'm going to shoot the number two high house, uh, since we're using it as an example, if I have to shoot that stage five more times that day, I may go ahead and stop and think about, hey, you know, fundamentals, what I need to do in my fundamentals during this shot. But if, if it's something that I'm shooting sporting clays today and I'm going to be shooting 50 different targets and I'm never shooting the same target, if I have a problem, it's gone. I'm never thinking about it again. The minute I pull the trigger, it's gone. I, I don't – I don't look at a, a target that I miss and go, man, I don't understand. I, I saw my sights here. I pulled the trigger. Nothing broke. You know, it's, uh, it, it's eating on me. I can't figure it out. It is gone. The shot's gone. Don't think about it. You need to focus about the good stuff. When you shoot and hit a target, that's just as important to actually see that and go, yep, you know, that, that's how it's supposed to be done. That's why we train. That's, you know, I, I'm capable of doing this. Now, we're not – really patting ourselves on the back, but mentally you are, you're telling yourself, Hey, what you're doing is right. You know, stay you're, with you're it. giving yourself the recipe, the beast. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. It's trust, trust, trust in you, trust your skill set. Yeah, you, you know, one thing I always ask a lot of the athletes is what were you focused on at that given moment? And, you know, maybe, you know, let's say clay shooting, um, maybe you, you weren't focused on the target that you were, you're were aiming for. Maybe you were focused on, what the gun was doing or you were focused on what someone was saying in the background or, or anything well, like that. And sometimes the answers are simple like that. Yeah. There's a deal called true pairs where, you know, when you're, when you're shooting, uh, you may uh, shoot two birds that fly at the same time. And a lot of times guys get ahead of themselves and, you know, they're trying to shoot the first bird fast because the second bird's getting farther away. So they don't give the initial bird, it's due and it's allotted time to make a good shot and, and break it and then move on to the next bird. So they end up missing the first bird and then swing to the second bird, but they're pulling the trigger on the second bird, thinking about missing the first bird and they miss both of them. And, and that's, then where, that's where we talk about speeding everything up. Instead of slowing yeah. things down, we're speeding things up and trying to and rush got, through it instead of getting the Slow down, be smooth, give the allotted time it takes to, to do it right. You know, it's not, it's not, be slow and hit the first one. It's like, do the first one right, be smooth. And, and, and we do this in practice. We, you know, we shot shotguns earlier this week. Uh, we'll probably go shoot shotguns tonight. Uh, once we get out there and we start some of the really hard, tough things, uh, once we start doing hard, true pairs, we'll find ourselves going like, all right, hey, just slow down. Just be smooth. And when we do, it's like, man, I had all the time in the world, crush both birds. But when I was trying to shoot fast, I was missing both of them. So it, it's something, and you can take that into every aspect, whether you're shooting three gun, uh, you're shooting PRS, uh, you, you know, you're doing some of the quick stuff that we do with long guns, absolutely pistol, IPSC, uh, IDPA, everybody outruns their sights as they call it. And that's the same thing. You know, you're, you're thinking about the target ahead. I can remember one time it was at uh, World and Cowboy Action shooting. I, I drew the pistol and I was pushing towards the first target. I, I saw my sights, my rear sights, my front sight was slightly above the target, but I was moving into it. And I went ahead and broke the shot thinking everything was, you know, going to be all right. And, and it actually didn't. And I shot over the target. Well, I caught the gun. Oh, I, 
back up. So I had actually pulled the trigger and hit the first target before I saw sights. But I was thinking about, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was able to hit the first target and I didn't pick up my sights. Pulled the trigger, seeing my sights on the second target and I actually missed it thinking I was going to hit it. So it, it's, we got to slow down. We, we got to think through the process and then allow ourselves to perform. And it, it, that's the, the difference that I see between top shooters, and, and I've been very fortunate. Uh, Rob Latham's a good friend of mine. Uh, Michael Voigt was a good friend of mine. Uh, Jim Clark Jr. was a great friend. Terry Cross. Uh, a lot of the exceptional, you know, shooters of the day, uh, I get to call good close friends. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the same thing. And it's, you know, we all, when we sit around and we talk about it, everybody has these same basic understanding and uh, belief in that that is huge. Is it the mental side, uh, the visualization, uh, knowing your skill level and being smooth at that skill level and not trying to overrun it? Now, do we, do we ever overrun it? Yeah, that's what training is. You know, when we're in practice, I'm wanting, to, I'm wanting to build up to a speed that I'm actually missing, you know, and when we're shooting shotguns, uh, we're trying to shoot it as fast as possible. Why? There may be a true pair where I need to have that skill set, and if I haven't built it, then I'm going to try to rush it. So uh, it's the same thing with shooting long range, shooting PRS, you know, it, anything, really any aspect of human performance is this way. You have to take the time, slow down, do your first job, uh, and then we can move on and do the second job. Now, now you kind of said this maybe a little bit earlier, but I, I'm going to kind of put this. Do you think, um, and, and this is any skill, basically, it's not just a shooting skill, but you almost have to separate your tasks. Of, and, and I think this is where dry fire comes in, is where one skill is working on, let's just say, mechanics uh, of what you need to do. And then the other is working on the process of how you're going to go about being successful on there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, you do separate different aspects of, of physical performance. Uh, you, you need to break down the fundamental side. And then, you know, there's, there's all different aspects. And my mind goes back to golf because it was really kind of in the golfing world where I really started developing a understanding of the, of the mental side of, of human performance. Yeah. Uh, but as you try to work a ball, uh, how you're going to set up, what you're going to do, not over swinging like you mentioned in, in baseball. Uh, and then there's, there's other times that, you know, we, we may be able to turn it loose a little bit because the error in, in, in that shot is acceptable. And yeah. so, you know, I, I may go ahead and try to rip it over the water because I got a big bell out right if I fade it a little bit. It's, it's not a problem. But, again, how would I know that if I didn't take and understand it through heavy training, heavy practice? You know, I, I, I think this is one thing that we can't get away from. Uh, most people want to buy success. Uh, they go out and they buy the best clubs. They go out and they buy the best guns. Uh, best. They may go do some training. Uh, they may not do some training. They may have a buddy that's pretty good and they try to learn from him. Uh, but it, even if they go do training and they buy the best gun, the best scope, uh, and they spend, you know, a weekend or two weekends that year out on the range uh, with an instructor, you know, that's, that's a good instructor, the, the reality is he's probably not going to be any better than he was the day he left, you know, those two days, if he didn't continue the training. So, you know, every one of the uh, top shooters, like I was talking about earlier, uh, these guys spend hours and hours, you know, out shooting. I can remember talking to Jim Clark Jr., which was uh, Jerry Mikulitz, uh I guess her brother-in-law's. And Jerry told me, or Jim Clark told me one time, he said, you know, Jerry has so much tenacity if he, try, he, if he tries something new, he doesn't come into the house until his hands are bleeding. And so this is, you know, everybody goes, oh, he's so fast. Well, yeah, he's done that probably 10 million times, you know. So this, this is something that, you know, I think people a lot of times aren't willing to pay the price and pay the dues to get the success that they want in the sport. Uh, sometimes. They just want to buy it. <laughs> yeah, they want to buy it. And, you know, and, and here's the other deal. It, it's kind of kind of unique and you tell me if you agree or not, but, but what I found is uh, a lot of times humans have our comfort zone and we, we are very comfortable, you know, a lot of times not being the best. Uh, we're comfortable being nearly good enough. And, and what I mean by that is I'll see guys out playing golf and they'll be, they'll be scratched, you know, they're, they're shooting straight 
And all of a sudden, you get to like maybe the eighth hole, and you go, man, you're, you're really playing good today. And uh, he said, you're even. And the guy goes, what? And he looks at his card, and he goes, you know, he was just having a good old time, you know, out there playing with his buddies. And all of a sudden, he double, double bogeys the next hole, getting back to his own comfort level. Because, and I'll see guys that nearly win a match. You know, they're, they're doing really good. They're right at it. All they have to do is sink a three-foot putt. And, and they miss it. And I mean, not by a little either. You know, it's, it's they're going to make sure mentally that they're not even close to making that putt. And, and a lot of times what it is and what I believe, uh, they're not comfortable with that level of success. They're very comfortable with where they are, their station in life right now. Uh, all their buddies come up to them and say, man, you nearly had it. You know, you're awesome. Uh, you'll get it next time. And he feels good about himself. You know, he gets accolades. Uh, he may – be afraid of the unknown, the unknown of winning, you know. So he may be afraid that his boss now is going to go, hey, you have to go out and give everybody uh, golfing instructions. Oh, when the CEO of, of our, our company is coming in, you have to take him to play golf, and you're not comfortable with that. You may think that there may be other repercussions from the win. Uh, you may think that your friends may not like you. So you're getting out of the the know, and, and a lot of people fear that, which I think that's, you know, Talking to a lot of the guys, uh, whether it was in the golf, my golfing career or uh, in the shooting career, what, what I found was most of the guys at the top of the heap absolutely relish in change. I mean, they push. They're looking for the unknowns. Uh, you know, so those are the guys that not only will spend the extra time, uh, and I think that's it's just a requirement. You're not going get, to get by without that. So they spend an excessive amount of time training, thinking about it, working on it. And then on the other hand, uh, most of these guys are, are willing to fail, and that's what a lot of people aren't willing to do. You know, so I, I've, I've seen people that had the opportunity to endeavor in anything that they wanted to financially, but they would, for, uh, you know, no better term, half-ass their approach to it, uh, and they wouldn't work as hard as they could have, uh, and so they get the results of that, and they go, ah, oh, if I would have worked harder, I could have made it. Well, you know, that's, that's up here. So he's thinking, you know, he didn't want to see his own failure. He didn't know it. He didn't want to see his own limits. So he just tells himself, hey, I was good enough. And, you know, if I would have tried harder, I could have made it. And he lives with that. It, it's better in, for some people, psychology, it's better to think you was good enough instead of finding out that you're not good enough and having to live with that which most of the top people in whatever sport that we're looking at, most of those people have failed numerous times and continue to fail. The difference is they get up and continue on. And that's a learning process and they take the value out of that learning process, even, even though uh, he finished second, fifth, 10th, and they take it back in and they work hard. And that's why those people are always back on the stage. They're always back up there winning. Uh, but they're, they're willing to put it out there and fail. I and mean, that's, that's a, a skill. I don't know if it's a skill. It's a uh, mentality that I believe all winners have to have. Uh, you have to be willing to fail. That's a awesome. You put it in so many great terms there. And, you know, even as you said, you know, they try harder and they fail. And, you know, that's why we, we always talk about try easier. Don't try yeah. hard. Everyone's afraid of, of, of the challenge sometimes. And, and it's like they, they make it so much more difficult than it, than it really is. And, you know, even some of the training that I do with some of the athletes, you know, we challenge them in different ways. So, you know, kind of what we were talking about, you know, before we got on this call is, is how to see things, how to answer the why. But you see a lot of these guys that don't want to answer the why. They just kind of, well, I could have or, or they try too hard. And, you know, it's just it, they, they have, you know, a lot of reasons where the guys who 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 tend to be not always the best, but very successful are, okay, what's the next challenge? Can you, can you ramp it up? What can I do? How do I go about this? This is frustrating me. I got to figure this out before I leave here. I mean, I've had some players that will not leave because they are like, I'm going to figure this out before I walk out the door. today. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I love it. You know, it's a, it's an awesome mentality that they have to be able to want to take themselves to another level on there. I, I think it's a must. I, I think that, uh, it, of course, that person is, it, he isn't afraid of, uh, what, you know, I told my boys growing up, said, you're not failing. The only time you fail is when you don't try, you know, when you don't give it a hundred percent. So, uh, I think everything that we do in life, uh, we should, we should work at it. 
my personal opinion. Do it 100% when there's no uh, pay value for you. Giving it 100%, go find something else and do it 100%. So uh, I, I don't think, you know, living a life of meteorocracy, you kind of, you know, halfway trying, uh, accepting failure is, oh, I could have done it. I could have been better. If I would have, you know, if I would have put in the time, uh, I, I could have been as good as anybody. I think we're just trying to tell ourselves that so that, you know, we can kind of live with ourselves. Uh, and, and unfortunately, our friends uh, that we may be around are doing the same thing. So everybody kind of keeps, you know, perpetuating the same stuff over and over. So it, it, it's something that, you know, uh, I, I don't want to live in that world. You know, I, I want to keep pushing. Uh, yeah, it's going to cause failure. You're, you're going to miss shots. You're going to miss tons of shots. So we were trying to make a particular shot this year. I won't go into exactly what it was. Uh, but we were trying to do something. And every evening we would get together and we would do this uh, extreme long range shot. And it took, honestly, probably 300 plus rounds before we were ever able to do it. So it, it, it's something that it's not, we're not accepting failure. We're learning from it and we're growing. Uh, but, but it's something that if, if you're trying to get to that next level, if you're trying to finish a task uh, and, and be at whatever level you're, you're chasing, you're going to have to, you know, accept failure as part of you trying and pushing yourself out on the edge and actually learning, you know. And that's not saying that, you know, you may not win nationals or you may not uh, uh, win world championships. Uh, we're talking about the local weekend match. You know, I, I can remember going to the local weekend matches and shooting and, and not winning at first. And then, you know, going back home and putting in the time, putting in the practice, building the skill sets, taking them to the next match. And then, you know, eventually getting better and better. And then, uh, again, moving from cowboy action, doing the same thing through sniper competitions. And then the military comes in and says, hey, you know, teach us how to do what you're doing. And back then, I, I can remember back in the early days, that one was uh, kind of the stand-up from our side. And the, this was the elite of the Marine Corps. And we actually sat down at night and we'd actually go through these mental classes and talk about visualization. And I would take them out on the next day, even though it was a sniper class and we would shoot pistols. And I would incorporate some of the things that I learned in the uh, cowboy action world, uh, which was incorporating the brain while you're doing the physical performance. So it, you had a standard run of targets that you had to do. It may be uh, one, one, three. The next pistol was uh, two, one, two. And you couldn't shoot anything out of order. So you had to engage the brain while you're actually running through that skill set, uh, which is actually really hard because most of the time, if we're thinking, this is where the mental aspect is so huge in the visualization is because uh, you you had to you had to run through it mentally well enough that you when the buzzer went off you wasn't thinking you just performed what you taught your brain how to do uh, <laughs> 15 seconds ago uh, so it, it, it's something that was, my language yeah it, it it was huge in that you know again the, what I always say is you train your brain. You train your brains for, for what's acceptable. And in times of stress, uh, in times of need, that's how you will perform. If you train your brain wrong, you're not going to like the results. Yeah. Well, you know, under stress, we, we tend to regress unless we train under those situations to be able to handle that stress. And, you know, you, you talk about the, you know, in other words, I'm using it as multitasking, the movement, the, the ability to process visual information to to be able to respond to that visual information without over analyzing and overthinking. And, you know, even, you know, I think we've probably talked about this in the past, but this is something that you kind of did. And these are kind of my words, but you analyze the situation. Then you visualize how you were going to accomplish it. And then you centered on your task at hand. You focused on that task and then you executed. You let it happen. You didn't force it to happen you let it happen and, and, and execute it. And when you did that, uh, you know, you, I, I know you know this, but you, you were very successful and you see other people being very successful instead of trying to overanalyze, over visualize the bad stuff, center on, centering on the wrong stuff and forcing the execution instead of letting it happen. Well, a lot of times in, in a timed event, uh, if, you're, if you're thinking you're in the past tense, so you're slower. So this is where the mental aspect is so huge because we want to be in the present tense and the present tense is happening now. And if you're actually thinking about it or thinking about your next shot or thinking about the last one, that actually takes time. And, and we're looking at 
you know, uh, milliseconds here. We're not looking at, you know, uh, he beat me by three seconds. He beat me by half a second, you know. And it, a lot of times just miss, missing a holster uh, and having to restab could actually knock you down to 10th place in that stage. So it, it, it's one of those things mentally we build the skill sets uh, and then uh, through mental focus, we teach our brain what's acceptable, and if you do your job well enough, your brain will perform, and you'll get the mental or the physical aspect of that uh, in your in your performance. And and I, I don't think you know th this goes across so many things. Uh, you know, I learned to fly a helicopter last year, uh, and it, it was funny. The first probably four or five hours while you're trying to learn to hover uh, is one of the craziest times because. There is no, you just cannot hover. You can't be still. You're, you're floating above the ground, but you're drifting one direction or the other. And you think you've got it figured out, and all of a sudden it starts going somewhere, and you didn't do anything. You, you, can't, you can't understand it. And you, you think about it at night. Like you said, you're laying in bed, you know, going through the process. is trying to figure out how to make this thing be still. Uh, and then all of a sudden you wake up the next morning, and somewhere in the night you figured out how to hover. And, and all of a sudden you get in the bird, and you're just like, hey, there it is. Well, what I do different, and you can't even you can't even put your finger on it. But now you have the skill, and so I think the mental aspect is is huge across the board in so many skill sets. It's not just sports. It's not just shooting. It's uh, uh, in in a lot of the things we do day to day in life. Uh, any physical aspect of human performance, uh, I think we can gain from the mental side and visualization. Yeah. Now, um, we haven't talked about this yet, but I really want to get the story out there because I think it's phenomenal, is uh, how you became a long-range uh, shooting instructor. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of, you can correct me here, but just to tell the story briefly, is you were a pistol instructor. Uh, you had some military coming in. Someone asked you to compete in a long-range shooting uh, competition that you had never done, and you did very well, correct? Well, it kind of quickly run through it. So yeah, I was, I had my own pistol schools. Uh, some Rangers called me up and said, Hey Todd, you know, could you come down and sh uh, teach us how to shoot pistol? I said, sure. So I went down, uh, taught them how to shoot pistol for a couple of days. And they said, Hey, stay and shoot the sniper cop with us. I said, I didn't bring a gun. Well, one of the guys said, Hey, I got an extra you can borrow it. So I set up that night looking at the horse gridded reticle and a track, the ballistic engine. I was like, man, I've never used any of this. And it was, it was, you know, way too much for me to, you know, pull in. Uh, a buddy sat down with me and, and kind of walked me through kind of what a lot of it meant. And so I was like, all right, I, I think I kind of got it. So I went to bed. Well, I woke up the next morning, uh, probably about five o'clock and my dad called at six and said he had cancer and uh, told me that they kind of give him about six months to live. And I said, well, I'm coming home. He said, hey, you know, we, we won't know anything till Monday, stay shoot your match and then, you know, we'll figure out what we need to do. Uh, well, dad beat cancer that time anyway. So, you know, to, to make a, a long story short. So everything worked out well. Mentally, I was not prepared for that in that match. So I, uh, I did pretty well. I ended up sixth place uh, in that match because I had some mental uh, steps that I didn't do well in the process because I was thinking about dad. Uh, and then I came back home. Well, they said, you know, anybody want to sign up for the uh, Snipers Challenge match? Uh, there outside of Dallas, and I was like, hey, you know, I didn't know it was the biggest match of the year, so I asked a buddy that I had met down there, I said, hey, you want to shoot it together? And he said, sure. So we went up there, and I won that match, and I won the next match, and I won the next match, and then the military, uh, actually, Horace was the designer of the, of the radical, and they called me, and they said, hey, man, you're winning all these matches. Would you help us and, and do some demos for the military? Now, this was after 9-11. And I was more than happy to help. I was ranching and farming still, so I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, this was, you know, I believe, I, as I remember, uh, probably just after the first of the year, and, and we weren't doing much, that much farming. So he, he, the owner, of course, said, if you would, we'll fly you to Quantico, and you can teach some, some Marines. So I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So he flies me out there, and I sit down and give a, uh, a class on the reticle and the ballistic, you know, uh, computer to the guys. And so everything goes really well. well I ended up making a lot of friends uh, in the Marine Corps on that trip. And, you know, I have stayed friends with some of that core group, you know, still today. Uh, but it, it was the first step. And then we went out to do a, uh, a shoot 
I believe it was in Yuma uh, for the what was the PSR, now it became the ASR, but it's a long range precision shooting. And we did some really good uh, shooting at 1,000, 1,500. Uh, it went up 2,000, but the Doppler couldn't pick it up at 2,000. So as long as you put it through the poles, they didn't care. So we ended up doing really well. I had a, a Dent One watch us there, and Dent One said, Hey, would you be willing to come in and show us? how to use the equipment. So I go in, show them how to use the equipment. Now this is out at Pendleton. And, you know, at the end of the week, uh, one of the head guys comes up and says, hey, uh, you know, you really hadn't taught us how to shoot. I said, no, nope, I'm a cowboy. I'm staying in my lane. So you didn't ask me to teach you how to shoot. You asked me to teach you how to use the equipment. And that's what I taught you. And he said, is there anything you change in, about, in our shooting? And I said, oh yeah, I changed a lot. And he laughed and he said, all right, Write it on the board. What would you change? So I had a big whiteboard there, and I just started listing everything that I saw that they were doing incorrectly, uh, at least in my mind, and if they would do it a particular way, uh, what benefit they would get from it. And so they looked at it, and they got together, and they said, okay, uh, we want to hire you for a month. And I said, all right, so uh, when do you want to do this? And they said, next month. And I went, cool, because I still didn't need to go farming. So it was still wintertime. I said, all right, let me call my buddy. So I called my buddy up in Utah. And I said, uh, can we come up and look at your place to do training? Because at the time, I didn't have a, a training facility that we could utilize here in Texas. And so we go up to Utah, look at my buddy's place, and it, it was awesome. Uh, it really fit for what we needed. So we ended up looking at it, going back, and spending a month out there training. Well, uh, Recon had come up on the range during that week at Pendleton, and they hired me for three weeks later. So I went back and trained Recon. Well, when I got back from Recon uh, and got home, seventh group was at the door so now we're training seventh group and uh then we go back out and we were training debt one for the month and as soon as i get back i had a call and had to go to brad for a week of training out there and then everything really started rolling and you know uh redesign reticles so i'm looking at reticles and i'm thinking about you know trying to solve problems so i'm like you know where do i see uh some of the big hurdles for long run shooting you know, what's taking time? What's causing problems? Why are we missing, you know, at different times? And so I looked at, uh, you know, truing was one of the very first things that we started doing way back when I was shooting competition. Uh, utilization of the ballistic engines wasn't giving me the performance that I was looking for. So I looked at a way, uh, you know, everybody was shooting dope back then. So when I'd go to a military sniper range, we would lay down for the first two days. First day at 600, the next day at 1,000. It'd take about 140 rounds and we'd shoot and get it up. So we'd shoot so many rounds at 200, so many rounds at 300 and so on, and write down, you know, what you hit with. It, it was just a, uh, a product of that's the way it's been done forever. And mm -hmm. so I looked at it and from a science uh, side. I thought, you know, it, it's re nothing's really changing in this. Why, why are we taking 140 rounds? You know, we have ballistic engines that, that give us a – uh, approximation of where the bullet's supposed to hit. That's what I believe back in the day. So it was a prediction of where the bullet's going to hit if the muzzle loss exists with a ballistic coefficient of this and a density altitude of X. And I said, you know, if we already know the density altitude because we've got these handy little kestrels, uh, handheld weather stations. So if we know the DA, that's one drag component. Uh, we know the BC, you know, at least we thought we knew the BC. Uh, that's another drag component, but it's a known. So I said, you know, what, what's the big variable is potentially the muzzle velocity. And so what we started looking at doing was actually truing ballistic algorithms based on listening to the bullet instead of trying to guess where the bullet's going to hit at all ranges and shooting and riding down, which actually brings in a lot of human error into that dope card. Uh, so, you know, when you're you know, building your first dope card, you're a student at the schoolhouse. So when you're a student at sniper school, you're, you're shooting potentially with all these little errors. So uh, two weeks later, your dope doesn't match what you're doing today because you changed what you're doing and now you're getting a different effect on target. So, you know, what I came up with was I asked the company Horace at ATRAG, I said, why can't we just tell the computer, let it do computer stuff, tell the computer where my bullet hit. And they said, oh, we don't think you're doing it right. And, and I was like, all right, you know, we, we fought over this for a couple of years. And so finally I said, hey, I'm out of here. I'm gone if I don't get true. And they said, all right. So he called me up and said, all right, what do you want? I said, just let me plug in where the bullet hit. And then you recompute the, the muzzle velocity based on that. And I said, this is in the supersonic. And then we'll do uh, B6 extrapolation is what we called it back then. 
uh, in the subsonic. And we talked through, basically it was connecting the dots, uh, placing the predictive algorithm over the actual flight path of the bullet. That's what we were doing. So we're, we're really taking a, a known of what the bullet did and actually bending the predictive curve to overlay the actual flight, flight track or the actual curve. So when you think about it, it's very simplistic. When I told Brian Lips the first time about it, I was like, uh, you know, hey, A plus B plus C equals D. And he was like, yep, he's a rocket scientist. So he gets that. I don't I have no clue what it means. But I said, all right, D is impact, right? And he said, yep. I said, C is density altitude. Uh, B is your ballistic coefficient. Leaves A, loss number function. He was like, oh my gosh. He got it that fast. So quit trying to predict where a bullet's going to hit. Listen to the bullet and actually reverse engineer uh, the, the actual true drop of the bullet all the way back. So we brought that uh, as well as new reticles, uh, reticles that had time of flight wind out set up patented and put in them. These reticles are used all over the world now. So, you know, and, and there's a lot of people, a lot of naysayers, you know, like, oh, that's too busy, blah, blah, blah. I was the same way. And usually when I hear somebody say, oh, it's too busy, you don't know how to use it. I was the same way. So I picked up a horse reticle first night and said, whoa, it's too busy. I really don't like it. Wish I had a, a mill dot, wish I had anything else. So the next day I shot it, I was like, yeah, I can see its advantages, still don't like it. The next day I shot it, I said, all right, it's, it, it's probably better than a mill dot, uh, but I'd still, I, I come from zones, I still like the old stuff. Third day I bought myself a scope. So uh, it, it's one of those things, once you're open and you're open to learning, uh, and, and everybody says the same thing, uh, that has given it on an honest trial with understanding from somebody that has taught them correctly how to use it. Uh, you know, I see a lot of people, they come in, they go, hey, uh, that's not what I've been told. This thing is amazing. And I'm like, yep, if you, if you learn how to use it properly, it's an amazing tool. And, and the wind dots give us a huge leap. And there's, there's a lot of stuff that we teach in the school. So, uh, so with that, your, your accuracy obviously improved tremendously and, and the waste of bullets in a sense uh, was, uh, was improved? Yeah, you, you know, here, I'll give you a quick analogy. Uh, you know, we said 140 bullets in two days to get to 1,000, and this was two full days of shooting. Well, well this year I had a 7 mil 300 Norman. We wanted to go out and do some shooting at two miles. Uh, we load up some ammo. We go and shoot five rounds, get the gun zero. Uh, we take the gun immediately out, and we threw it at 1,887 meters. Now, that was the next shot. We didn't shoot it 200, 300, 400. 1,887 meters was a, a wall, a rock wall face on the side of the hill. We took three shots, trued out the muzzle which we were probably about 30 feet per second off is in our guess. And then we went straight to 3,230 meters, which is a little over two miles. And the first shot was just off the left edge of the target. Now, we're talking five rounds to to zero, three rounds to true. The ninth round was just left at over two miles away. So it, it gives wow. us a capability that we haven't had in the past as far as in the traditional sense of long range shooting and gathering dope. So, so just as a, as a dummy, tell me, um, you're talking about two miles shot. What's, what's the farthest shot uh, that you guys have taken? Accurate. You know, Way back in the day, I had a whole bunch of Marines with me up in Utah at my buddy's place, and and we were out shooting, and, and we, we were we were talking and teaching uh, time of flight and teaching uh, uh, truing and how we could actually work this through. Now, this was prior to even having it in the engine itself. We we didn't have that truing capability. We had to manually go in and chase it. And so I was teaching them how to bend the curve using uh, a, a ballistic engine. And we shot that day out to 4,889 meters. Now, in today's world, everybody jumps up and down and says, oh, new world record. And I go, yeah, not really. It's pretty beer drinking, you know, story. <laughs> so it, it's, it's one of those things. We, we shot a truckload of ammo from, you know, 500 meters to 400 or 4,889 meters. And, you know, there was probably 13 guys that actually hit the target that day uh, at that distance. And it was one of the, and I, some of the guys probably hit it in the, in the mag and some guys probably hit it in uh, 15 mags. And we all knew the dope already because somebody had already got us on, you know, we kind of worked up the, the, uh, the dope up to a certain point and we were shooting at that distance. So it was, uh, we already knew what to hold basically. And so it, some guys got lucky quick, some guys didn't get lucky and they had to stay on it, had no, nothing to do with steel set or anything. It was just that, 
you know, we've shot up that far, but it's not a new world record. It's just uh, good fun. Uh, I, I like what they're doing with King of the Two Mile. It kind of takes away the aspect of, uh, hey, I shot 422 times and finally hit a target at 5,000, and it's a new world record. Well, no, it's, it, it's a good fun shoot. Enjoy it. But uh, a world record should be something that is based off something like they have at King of Two Mile, which is a, a great competition where you have to lay down and you're under a certain amount of time to get so many shots off, you know, and try to shoot out to uh, a distance. And they start closer, you know, it's not anywhere near close, but they start at closer targets and work their way out. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a great sport. They've done really well for that long range crowd. That's fascinating. You know, um, you skipped over something very quickly, so I, I want to go back on this. Um, when you won that first competition, not the first one you were in, but the second competition, you won, you got first place, and I believe you. Uh, there's a story about where you had the gun, but you didn't own a gun. You borrowed a gun, and but you had no ammo, so you didn't have a lot of practice to go to that competition. So. And I think I know your answer because we've talked, but I also know because you've already kind of talked. I imagine you did a lot of visual dry firing uh, preparation yeah. for that. Yeah, you know, basically I, I would go through. So the, the deal is I had this ballistic computer and I still had the, the same gun that the guy let me borrow on the first one. I asked him if I could borrow it and bring it to the next match because now I was intrigued with the reticle and I didn't own one uh, like that. And his gun, it was his spare gun. He was nice enough to let me borrow it. So I went home, ordered ammo from Black Hills. Uh, it actually didn't show up until the day before I left. So, I mean, it, it was actually dark when it showed up on UPS living out in the country. So I had zero time to even zero the weapon system. So I thought, well, I'll zero it at the range. But that whole week I went through the process of mentally going, okay, I got a, a shot at 784 meters and I would plug it into the uh, ballistic engine. I'd look at my hold and I'd visualize that hold on the target and breaking the shot, making a wing call changing my own call left and right, just training the brain. Uh, and, and it was huge because without that, I would have been behind the curve, right? And so a lot of this is timed events and stuff. So uh, it, training your brain, again, is, is huge. Uh, and it gave me the capability to, to go in and win that match and the next few ones after that and then opened up some doors. You know, the, winning the competitions really just opened the door to allow me to go in and and do the uh, military training, they don't come to me and say, all right, show us how to work well. I, I've trained a lot of them to, to shoot competition, uh, but most of the military comes to me and says, hey, uh, teach us how to shoot better, farther, uh, that kind of stuff, not necessarily, you know, train us how to do positional stuff like PRS or that kind of deal. So it's uh, PRS is a great skill set. It, it, it's a, a great match. The skill set of unconventional shooting positions is awesome. Everybody needs to work at it more. Uh, my deal is, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll have a group come in and they'll say, hey, Todd, we don't want to do any belly shooting. We, we want to shoot off shooting sticks, tripods, you know, the whole time we're here. I'm like, dude, awesome. I love it. it it's one of my most favorite classes because you're training the brain and you're actually having to use the brain while you're shooting, you know, multiple points of contact, this kind of thing. Then you get outside the next day and the wind's blowing 33 miles an hour like it was two days ago. And, you know, they get out there and they put up their tripod and they turn around and they go get their uh, ammo and the gun and the tripod's laying on the ground because the wind blew it over. And they get up on the tripod and, and the wind's actually moving them around. We've had days where the wind moved us in the prone to where it was hard to hit targets because we don't shoot big E-type targets. Uh, just in the prone being still trying to, you know, position up, uh, get very steady in the prone, very hard sometimes just to be stable uh, due to the wind. So I think... Positional shooting is huge. Fundamentals, if, you know, I tell guys all the time, if you can hit 70% of the targets in the prone, then let's move to shooting sticks, all right? Because if you can't hit the target in the prone, why are we getting up in a uh, less stable environment? So it, it, if the guy's going downrange, uh, if this is a pre-deployment training thing, uh, absolutely we'll shoot, you know, even if he's not hitting, you know, great in the prone, we may move to positional because that's something he may need as a skill set uh, for what he's fixing to do. So it's it's something that you know uh, we work on and we try to get the guys to focus on fundamentals. Awesome, Todd. You know we can I can keep talking. I got a lot of thoughts and you know um, I knew you know some of the reasons you you're very successful is the way you you learned. However, you learned at a young age is how to picture 
and creating those right pictures and, and visualizing. And, you know, I, I kind of joke around, I've said this in some of the other web webinars, visualization is visual, it's not mentalization. And it's really, you know, if you don't know how to put those right pictures in, um, you're going to get bad output in a sense. So as much as you're talking about brain, we're, I mean, we're on the same page. Um, you know, we, we talk about how the eyes function. Are you getting the right information to allow you to make the actual response? And it's all co conjoined. There's the physical, the mental, and the visual to make these athletes superior than, than most. Um, with that, I just have one last question for you quick on and add anything else you want as we wrap this up here. But if, just for, for people who listen to this uh, curiosity, if let's say I have five guys, I don't know, maybe it's 10 guys, I don't know. And I wanted to come out and I wanted to, I, we know nothing about long range shooting that we want to learn. What, what kind of process with, with uh, not obviously competition level, but, but learn some basics and have some fun. What, what's something like that? You know, it, it's, it, we, we do it all the time. It's really easy. So uh, we have two, three, four day classes, whatever you know, your time allows for. Uh, it really doesn't matter. I have, even in the military, I have guys come in, they'll say, Hey, uh, Tom, we've got eight schoolhouse training stoppers. Most of what I train is all guys that have already been through the schoolhouse. We're coming for more advanced stuff. And so, you know, or sustainment training. And a lot of times they'll say, Hey, we're bringing a couple of guys, you know, they're not long range shooters. They know nothing about it. And most of the time, those guys are in the top two or three of the whole class by the time they leave. They don't have to unlearn anything. So uh, as far as skill level, before guys call me up all the time, and, you know, what prerequisite do I have to have to come? And I'm like, none. You know, be safe. Get here. We'll talk about everything once you get here. Don't worry about it. Uh, it it's really not that hard. So I had a lady that came out. Uh, we were doing the rotary recoil classes. So we have a, a, a helicopter course and one for the military, one for the civilians, the rotary calls the civilian side. And, and they go all over and they shoot targets. It's a 50 mile gun run. It's one of the funnest things you're ever going to do. So- <laughs> I've seen some of your pictures, it looks cool. Yeah, they, they want to do a little long range shooting as well. And the little girl that had came uh, had never shot a long gun before, had never shot a scope before. And it, they didn't have a lot of time. They were doing all this other stuff. So we flew out in some helicopters, sat down on the ridge, uh, we had a target setting up at a mile away, and she got on her third shot. She hit at a mile and had never shot a scope drop before. So this isn't obviously we're calling win for that kind of deal, but but this isn't hard, you know. So uh, it used to be hard. Nowadays, it's not so hard. If you have the right equipment and the proper training, anybody can do this, and a family can enjoy it. So it, it's uh, something that, you know, you can do with your family, you can do with your son, you can do with your daughter. Uh, you and your wife can enjoy it, or you can get away from the world and drive, do it by yourself and get to the level that you're happy, you know. So shooting, I, I talked to a guy yesterday on the phone. He said, you know, he, he's never, he's not comfortable shooting over a thousand. And, and there's no reason other than he's not being trained properly. And it, it's not like, I, I wouldn't tell him, you know, you, if you come in every week for three weeks, we can finally get you over a thousand. Uh, we'll have him shooting out to a mile the first day. Uh, and then we'll teach him during that two, three, four day process, you know, we can teach him how to do it when he goes home by himself and, and how to break the shot down, uh, how to break down when calling that kind of deal. So to your question, it's easy, sign up and away we go. You, you'll enjoy it. Awesome. Well, hey, I appreciate your time. This is, uh, it's always fun for me and, and have these kind of conversations and I'm ready to get out of town and head up to Canadian, Texas and, uh, and disassociate with the world for a while. <laughs> well, I think that's what we're doing right now anyway. So, but Ryan, enjoyed, enjoyed talking to you the last time we got to talk and enjoyed this and uh, holler at me when you want to do it again. Yeah, sounds good. Appreciate it. Right.